we talk a ton about creating high odds, low impact setups. To be most effective, you have to match your improvements to the habitat. Western habitat, heck of a lot different than Midwestern habitat. He's not putting all that energy into building up his antlers until his body's taken care of. The overwhelming majority of the tips that I come up with are issues I'm running into while I'm out here working. It's quite possible that nothing has done more for my success than odor control. I am an one of the absolute biggest things that we can do over the to top improve our odor hunting control ground fanatic. is simply not hunt specific. I don't care areas. what I'm talking about what is setting aside the majority of our deer cover as sanctuary. This goes against absolutely everything we think we know as hunters. I mean, man, growing up, it is just pounded in your head. You got to get deeper. You got to get deeper. You got to go deeper and further into the woods to find where those deer are at. And every single time we do that, we are leaving telltale signs behind that we're out there hunting them. Deer are no different than your dog at home. They can be trained to accept virtually anything and they can be trained to fear virtually everything. Every single time we're going out in the woods, we're leaving odors, we're spooking deer, we're kicking them up. What we're doing is we are training them. We are training them to be more nocturnal. We're doing this type of stuff during the daylight so they need to shift their activity more to nighttime. Now, deer truly are not nocturnal animals. They dwell in the twilights. You know, of course they're active during the night. Heck, they're active during the day. As a matter of fact, there's five peak movement periods in any 24 hour cycle for deer. That's the middle of the day, PMs right around, uh, right around sunset, twice in the middle of the night, and once in the morning. Okay, so deer naturally, naturally are going to be active during parts of all portions of the day. Okay, but by trashing their deer woods, what we end up doing is we end up training them to be more nocturnal. One of the biggest mistakes we make as hunters is hunting too darn much of our ground. When you can go ahead and produce food like this, I mean, man, these are, this is from Antler King's Honey Hole. These are some flipping turnips here now, boys. When you can do that and you leave that deer cover alone, what ends up happening is the does and fawns end up coming out during legal shooting light. Mr. Big is back there in the timber. He's watching them. They're safe. They're safe. They're safe. All right, I'll still wait till after dark. And then they'll do it again and again and again until all of a sudden they decide, you know what? I can step out and I can get me some food. I'm hungry. And you happen to be sitting there waiting for them. When you go ahead and treat your ground as sanctuary, even when the neighbors, the neighbors, they're pummeling the snot out of their ground. What ends up happening is the deer, they go like this. They go like that into the pockets where they feel safe. We want that to be our ground. And then we train them on our ground. You can move during daylight hours because we are not disturbing the woods. We are placing such high importance on low impact high odd stands, I, I, as long as the deer do not see us, as long as they don't smell us, as long as they don't hear us, as long as we don't shoot them, we weren't there. Perception is reality in the deer world. Train them to not feel pressure on your ground and all of a sudden you take all those neighbors that are walking out to their stand a half hour after sunrise, dragging their car hearts through the woods, they go from working against you to working towards your goals. As those deer feel pressure, where do they go? They go to those areas that they feel safe. When you got the food, when you got the deer cover, when you got that feeling of safety, more often than not, that becomes your ground. I tell a sense of smell, at least for a good part of the season, every bit as well as I can. Grown Big TV is brought to you by Ten Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. Redneck Blinds. 
the best hunting blinds on the planet. Furminator, the best food plot implement on earth. Hunter Safety System, saving lives is what we do. And by Antler King, bigger bucks, healthier deer. This segment of Grown Big TV is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. I'm sure it didn't take much convincing at all to drill through the power of sanctuary. When you can hunt ignorant deer, it's just so much easier. That said, we're not done yet. Sanctuaries are great for drawing deer, but at the same time, if we want to hunt our property effectively, we need dead zones. If we've got deer everywhere on the ground, how do we get to and from the stand safely? That's what we're going to talk about next. One of the biggest challenges we have as managers is fighting the temptation of improving every square foot of our ground. The desire is understandable. You know, I, man, if you can improve every square foot of your ground, make it the best habitat around, you can hold more deer. And that is very true. The problem is, is how do you hunt them now? There are tremendous advantages to keeping the deer on your ground stupid and even more so to the small landowner. When you've got neighbors that are absolutely pummeling their woods, you want to create your property as a sanctuary. That way you suck them in as the neighbors are hunting. Every day of hunting season that goes on, you can make it so that your deer population keeps going like this while everybody else is going like that. But the key to doing so is to keep the deer ignorant of hunting pressure while they're on your ground. Having hunted public ground since I was a kid, all the way up until this day and age, the entire key to my approach to hunting public ground, or any, any ground that's absolutely pummeled, is to go ahead and find those locations that no one else goes because guess what? Replicate that on our 20, on our 40, on our 60 acre properties, on our 3,000 acre properties if you're lucky enough to have one. You replicate that, and what ends up happening? All the deer from the surrounding area, when they get pressure, boom! They end up hitting your property because they feel safe there because it does not matter how hard we hunt that property, if the deer don't realize that they're being hunted, they're not. Perception is reality. Coming full circle back, that is why we cannot improve every square foot of our ground. If we do that, the deer are gonna be everywhere. If the deer are everywhere, how are we gonna get in to hunt without bumping deer? How are we gonna get out to our stands without bumping deer? You can't do it. Dead zones are critical, but here's a catch. I have to credit one of my uh, photo evaluation uh, clients for coming up with this idea. He and I kicked this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm telling you, it's surprising as a side note, it may be surprising, to hear, I would say over half of my photo evaluation clients consist of the top 20% of habitat managers I know. And David Wallen is no exception from New York, where they have very, very bad winters, just like in Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota and the UP of Michigan, those types of places where overwinter browse is mission critical. He wanted to go ahead and try to make it so that he could produce more browse even in his dead zones, those zones that you generally are safe to travel through. And here's what we came up with. Selective thickening. What you do is you go into those dead zones and you hinge cut the very low timber value trees. You know, just about the diameter like this. What you want to do is you want to hinge cut it just enough so that there's extra browse for when it gets really bad, but nowhere near the level of browse that there is back over here where we want them to be. There's just enough cover so that when they're going through there, they have to dog for does a little bit harder. Just go through and hinge cut a level of low timber value trees to increase the cover, increase the browse, but not so much as to go ahead and inspire bedding or regular feeding in these areas. You do that, now come late winter, when those deer desperately need that browse and they're starting to put the hammer down on the quality browse, 
they can go ahead and transition out to these dead zones that were selectively thickened to go ahead and get some more browse. Grown Big TV is brought to you by Chestnut Hill Outdoors. Reconics, see what you've been missing. And by Wildlife Research Center, the gold standard. We've covered the power of sanctuaries. We've covered the power of dead zones. Now, let's put a cherry on top and let's target specific areas and offer them absolutely everything we, they could possibly desire. We do that and man, now, now we just took our deer hunting up yet another level. To really get the most out of your habitat improvements, the whole key, if you want to truly, truly manage deer, you can do so even on as little as the right 40 acres. Sure, it helps if you got 500, but even on 40 acres you can do it. But here's the key. Offer the deer absolutely everything they want and need better than they can get over on the neighbors and they're going to spend a disproportionate amount of time on your property. So what is it that deer want and need? First, they need food. They need food. Their food sources are going to change throughout season. You need to offer them the best food they can get. Next, safety. I'll tell you what, if deer do not feel safe on that ground and they can feel safe somewhere else, that's where they're going to go. They would be willing to go ahead and completely disregard that food in an area that they're that they feel unsafe in to move to an area that they feel safe and have lower quality food. That's a big advantage to us managing is we can set these things up so that the minimum amount of pressure is felt by these deer so you can trick them. You can actually hunt a property hard and trick them into feeling safe on that ground. Next, water. Offer them the best water sources that they can get in the area. That doesn't mean some crystal clear trout stream. What that means is a muddy little puddle that that mud is adding minerals into that water, the deer are gonna hit it. So we've got food, we've got safety, we got water, next we've got comfort. That comfort is determined by offering them thermal cover. Offering them thermal cover in the summer for shade. Offering them thermal cover in the winter for heat retention. Okay, then minimizing social pressure. How do you minimize social pressure? You do so by dividing up the property. If you've got a hundred acre property, do not put in one primary food source, one primary bedding area. Instead, put in four. By doing that, you can get one doe group and one mature buck to bed over here and feed over there. You can get another doe group and another mature buck to bed and feed over here. You can get another to bed and feed there and another pair to feed over here. Don't try to cram them all into the same spot. That social pressure is very, very hard on these animals. By dividing things up, you're better off. Lastly, breeding opportunities. You follow what we just got done describing and there are going to be does there. There's going to be a lot. When it comes to doe harvest, harvest those does that are jumping the fence. Those does that are jumping the fence, bedding on the neighbors, feeding on yours, they're working against our goals. The does that are bedding on us and feeding on us, they're working for us. Why? Because Mr. Big can run all around our property because the does aren't leaving in order to find breeding opportunities. When it comes to managing deer, you offer deer absolutely everything they want and need better than they can get from the neighbors, you're going to get them to spend a disproportionate amount of time on your property and that enables you to manage them. I really can't tell you how lucky we are today to be here with Ian Wallace of Chestnut Hill Outdoors. Um, what most people don't realize is 
This, this man right here, do not let his age fool you. He has forgot more about, about soft and hard mass trees than somebody like me can pretend to ever have learned. This guy has lived it. First off, Ian, thank you yeah. simply for being here. Ian is, <clears throat> is one of the owners of Chestnut Hill Outdoors. And anybody who really is serious about habitat improvement understands that chestnuts are a big deal. But there's also a lot of, well, for lack of a better term, Ian, mystery surrounding it. Why don't we start right off, right out of the gate, what makes chestnuts such an awesome draw for whitetails? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, and it's kind of a misunderstood thing that chestnuts were the most populous hardwood in America for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, and deer and wildlife and humans and early American settlers uh, relied heavily on eating chestnuts. Uh, in the fall when they produced. Um, Such as the old Christmas songs. Yep, <laughs> chestnuts roasting over the open fire. And what happened is uh, in the early 1900s, a Chinese chestnut blight was introduced into New York when they brought a chestnut tree in and uh, it, it wiped out the whole uh, American chestnut forest. It, it was easily the largest ecological disaster in American history, as far as we know in our written history. And um, because of this, uh, there, there was des it completely decimated uh, a whole food source that you know, millions of wildlife and humans depended on. Yeah. And what, what make, specifically, what makes the chestnut such a powerful draw? Right. And so, <clears throat> you know, because of this food source lasting for so long, uh, you know, ch most wildlife depended on it. Um, and the reason that they depended on it over other sources of food was because it was just such a high nutrient rich nut. Uh, it's about 40% carbohydrate and 10% and protein. And if you, if you think about it, it's more like the potato of nuts, um, you know, versus most nuts are mostly high in fats and uh, chestnuts are almost purely energy source, uh, carbohydrates and sugars for uh, animals to take their energy. Um, the American chestnut, like I described, was uh, the primary hardwood forest in uh, America. It was the native tree uh, to, to populate uh, the eastern hardwood forests. Um, so this tree was a, a really vigorously grown tree. It didn't have a terminal height. So it grew just like the redwoods uh, of the Californian forests. Um, some of the trees were absolutely massive. The, uh, the Chinese chestnut is native to China, and it is a more of a bushy and smaller um, tree form than the American chestnut. Well, what happened was the American chestnut was wiped out due to this Chinese blight. And uh, my great-grandfather, Dr. Dunstan, uh, who was a plant breeder uh, in, the, in the 1920s, was uh, was given some American chestnut wood that was found in a grove of dead and dying chestnuts, but there was uh, one chestnut that was still standing, seemed to have a resistance to the blight. Dr. Dunstan uh, received uh, the American chestnut budwood in the mail, and he crossed it with a Chinese chestnut, uh, and, and then crossed back with a few other varieties, and <clears throat> His goal was to create uh, a chestnut that had the growth properties and nut qualities of the American chestnut, but with the with blight scale, resistance really. of the Chinese chestnut. And that's what we know as the Dunstan chestnut today. And, and as of today, every single Dunstan chestnut sold in this country, in this world, comes from your grandfather and comes from Chestnut Hill Outdoors, doesn't it? Absolutely, it no. does. We're the sole owners of the Dunstan yeah. Chestnut and uh, we've been producing it for just about 30 years as the tree farm. Uh, and we've planted millions of acres yeah. and reforested the chestnut forests yeah. uh, in, in America. So, ladies and gentlemen, this young man and his family are quite honestly, single-handedly responsible for the chestnut to continue to thrive and for producing such an 
awesome. Truly, I, I've planted all sorts of them myself. Awesome food plot draw for whitetails. Ian, thanks a lot, bud. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat>